Amen. Welcome back, Family Church. Wow, is it cold outside. Man, I walked outside this morning and like tears like froze in my face. It got so cold. Uh, those of you watching online, we are continuing our series called The Language of Love. I hope that it is helping you in your relationships as much as it's helping me. Anytime a preacher is up on stage pointing a finger and preaching, remember there's three fingers pointing back, all right? So none of us has arrived. None of us has all the answers. The only thing that we can do is preach Jesus and him crucified, all right? All we can do is press towards the mark for the prize of the high call. So when talking about relationships, when talking about love language, when talking about building each other up, we all have major room to grow, all right? Uh, last weekend, I truly enjoyed sitting and listening to Ronnie Doss present to us what a great time we had, not just here on a Sunday, but we had a staff training on Saturday, and I got to hang out with him all the weekend, so I really, really enjoyed that. We've already uncovered, how many did we do so far? Two, right? We did words of affirmation and quality time, Today, we are going to look at two more love languages, and then next week, we are going to weigh in on physical touch all by itself. But today, we're going to look at gifts and acts of service. Gifts and acts of service. So let me ask you this. This is a moment for you to be part of what I'm about to say. How many of you in here love receiving gifts? You love receiving a gift. Right? And a person who truly loves receiving gift, it really doesn't matter what the gift is. It could be an expensive gift, it could be a cheap gift. So like, receiving gifts really isn't my love language, but if you bought me something like really sick, like you're gonna wow me, right? Um, but then let's look at this on the flip side. How many people in here love giving gifts? See, all right. So you like to speak the language of giving gifts, but it might not be your love language to receive gifts. We love to see the response on someone's face when we give them a gift. And that, the love language of gifts can be a very misunderstood language. It can be a very misunderstood language. The person whose love language is not gifts feels sometimes that the person whose love language is gifts if, is self-centered and greedy. That can happen. Your language is gifts, and when someone gives you a gift, it just means the world to you. But like, how many gifts can I give you? How many bouquets of flowers can I give you? Right? Come on, somebody. Nobody ever felt this way? When in fact, it has nothing to do, someone's love language of gifts has nothing to do with them being self-centered or greedy. The gift in and of itself is not the thing that fills their love tank. The actual present, the gift itself, is not the thing that fills their love tank. The fact that you thought of them, the fact that you were out shopping and saw something that you knew they would like, that is what fills their love. <gasps> you thought of me. You knew I would like this. You know the things I like. You listened to me when I said that I would like this for Christmas. You listened when I said in passing I'd like this for my birthday. How about a just because gift? Huh? And the gift doesn't even have to be a expensive or physical gift. A person whose love language is gifts, they remember the setting that they receive the gift. They remember the sounds or the environment in which they were in when they received the gift. That's why it's not so much about the gift. It's about the experience in which they received the gift. Oh, I remember when you gave me this ring. We were on the beach in Maui. 
Not in New York where it's cold right now. I can still smell the salt water and I can feel the sun beating on my head. I can remember everything about the moment because the whole experience was the gift. You thinking about them was the gift. As a mom, can I talk to moms for a second? You can remember that time that your kid brought wild flowers out of the backyard and was just so happy with the bouquet that they had picked from the yard and you felt so loved that your child thought about you and picked all the dandelions and brought them into the house. <laughs> Ugliest bouquet in the world, yet so meaningful because your child was in the yard picking dandelions for you. So let's look at this in the Word of God today. The most popular Bible verse in the world, even non-Christians know it, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave a gift. He gave a gift. He spoke the love language of gift giving. Not only wrapped up in the gift itself, but the fact that he thought about you. He thought about humanity. He thought how he would pay the price to bring you back into a relationship with him. Maybe you can remember the moment that you received the gift of Jesus Christ. Maybe you can remember the church service. Or maybe you received the gift of Jesus at home watching TV and you can remember the moment when you reached your hand towards the TV and accepted that gift of salvation. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God gave us a gift because he loved us. He loved us. My wife's love language is not gifts. I really wish it was, because it would be so simple. I could go on Amazon, order something, done, right? So I'm gonna talk to the, to the dudes for a second, all right? Because I really misunderstood marriage and relationships. I'm just trying to make sure there's no like little kids in here, because we might get a little TV 17 real quick. I can remember first year marriage thinking to myself, it would be nice to do a little making out tonight. Come on somebody, you know what I'm trying to say without being graphic. So on the way home from work, I stopped and bought some flowers and I'm like, yeah, boy, I'm gonna walk in there, give her these flowers. She's gonna be so elated. She's gonna be all over me. It didn't go down like that. And I'm like, something's broken with these flowers. So then I'm like, did I? So I give her the flowers. She's like, oh, these are beautiful. Thank you. Why'd you buy these? Because I love you. And we got this little saying that we do, it's called schmilly. Schmilly just basically means see how much I love you. So I wrote Schmilly on the card. Mm. Put on my Keith Sweat music. <laughs> Next thing I know, she's sleeping on the couch. Knocked out. Sound asleep. And I'm like, hey, I bought you flowers. She's like, thank you. I had a long day. <laughs> pacing, because now, like seriously, ladies, you don't understand, but for a guy who did that much work, and he had his mindset on what was going to go down, and you're asleep, chest gets tight, anxiety, it's over, it's over, relationships over, like, we, men are stupid, like, we don't know what to do. Don't know what to do with that. But I had to learn. She didn't really care about flowers. 
It wasn't, it, the flowers were nice. It was a nice thought, but it wasn't going to be a thing that filled her love tank. And now she was like, girl, I want to make, mm, da, da. It, I didn't know. And seriously, for years, Schmilly, flowers. <laughs> Until I found this teaching, this understanding that the gifts really weren't her love language. I could have bought her the most expensive thing in the world. It didn't mean that she was gonna reciprocate in any way because it wasn't the thing that told her how much I love her. I wanna look at another verse in the Bible. Check this one out. Romans 6, I hope that helps somebody just to open up some communication because maybe you're the husband, flowers, smelly, sleeping, <gasps> all right? It's a bad cycle, man, it's messed up. Romans 6, 23, check this out. For the way, I gotta say it in Pentecostal voice, is that okay? For the wages of sin is death. If you've been in church, any amount of time, your pastor preached that, and man, he probably had an altar call as soon as he said those words, right? Those first seven words, preached it, preached it, preached it. The wages in his death, the wages in his death. Come down to the altar, give your life to Christ. And they don't read the second 13 words. They only preach seven, but almost double in the scripture says, but, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Does it make it any less true that the wages of sin is death? No, it is true. But, and it's a really big but. Huge, huge. But, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin that this is talking about is the rejection of Jesus Christ. It's the fall of humanity. It's the sin nature outside of the God nature. That is death. But the gift of God, what Jesus Christ did for us, was the free gift given to humanity brings about eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Watch this verse, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It's a gift of God. It's a gift of God. You cannot live a life good enough to impress God. You can't do it. And you can't live a life bad enough that you surprised them by it either. For by grace, thank you, Lord, for grace. For by grace have you been saved through faith. Not of yourself, not of your works, not of your deeds. But it's a free gift from God. We didn't have to earn the gift. We just have to receive the gift. And there's a lot of false humility in receiving free gifts. Oh, no, 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 I couldn't. And inside, I really want that. Someone gives you a gift, oh no, I couldn't accept it. Because the insecurity on the flip side is, I didn't get you anything. And we live in this life of deficiency that says, I can't receive a gift that I did not somehow reciprocate. Just let me tell you, you can turn the mic down just a little bit because I'm gonna get loud. Let me just tell you something about this. You can never reciprocate the gift of Jesus Christ in your life. You can never do that. It's completely impossible. Yes, you can honor God with your lifestyle. You can honor God with your body. Yes, you can. But you can never do enough to earn the free gift of salvation. You can never pay the price of sin. You can never do that. So instead of sitting back saying, no, no, I can't, I can't. Okay, give it to me. Thank you. Thank you. I don't deserve it. I get that, but I'll take it. All right, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. You saw the news. Someone just won the mega millions. They won $1 billion. Someone in Michigan, $1 billion. If that was your family member, 
And they said, hey man, I love you so much. Here's a $10 million check for my one billion. I know I couldn't. I'm like, ah! <laughs> I wouldn't even think twice. I said, you can come over for dinner next week, thank you. But I would take the money. Are you kidding me? Take Jesus, man. Take some Jesus at his word. It's a free gift. He spoke the language of love to you. If your love language is gifts, then I pray that your spiritual love tank is filled today knowing how much God loves you that he gave you gifts and he gives you gifts every day. The Bible says that his mercies are new every morning, which means he deposits a new gift in you every day of mercy. Morning endures for a night, but then he gives you a gift, joy, that comes in the morning. All right, okay, I'll tell you, don't get me preaching right now. Gifts to a person whose love language is gifts is a visual symbol of love. Visual symbols of love are more important to some people than to others, right? Let's look at this. One of the greatest moments in your marriage or in a relationship is the exchange of a gift called wedding rings. To some people, from wedding day on, they never take it off because, oh my God, this is the symbol of love. They gave me this gift, I put it on. Others, it's rare to see me wearing one. Not that I don't uh, love the fact that I'm married and that I have a wedding ring, but I've lost so many of them. And I do so many things with my hands that when I'm working on a construction project, I don't want it on there. I don't want to mess it up or I don't want to like, get my fingers stuck on something. So I very rarely wear one. It doesn't mean that I don't appreciate the gift as much as somebody else, but someone whose love language is gifts, they honor that thing and they're so about it, right? People have different love languages. So let me ask you this, do you think that the person that you're in a relationship with, that their love language is gifts? If it is, then let me help you out a little bit. Because someone whose love language is gifts automatically thinks yours is too. So they're gonna keep buying you stuff that you don't want just because that's what they would want. Okay. Here, let me help you out. Married to someone in a relationship with someone whose love language is gifts, make a list of all the gifts that your loved one has expressed excitement about receiving throughout the years. My wife's obviously is not flowers. Okay, so that would never go on the list. They may be gifts that you have given or gifts that a family member or a friend gave them and when they got it, it was like, oh my gosh, right? Maybe it's makeup, maybe it's a car, maybe it's a new tool, I don't know, right? The list then will give you an idea of the kind of gifts that your loved one would like to receive in the future. It's a little bit of work, but just watch, right? Maybe. Maybe getting a gift card to a restaurant, they get all excited about it, right? And take them out to eat. Give them the gift of a date night, whatever that might look like, right? If you have not paid attention to them or cannot recall any moments in which they got super excited about a gift, then maybe ask a close friend or relative, what do they like? And then don't wait for a special occasion. Don't wait for anniversary. Don't wait for a special Valentine's Day. Go out and give them a schmilly. Go buy them a schmilly. A schmilly is just because. See how much I love you. Thought about you today. Knew you'd like this. And listen, let me just give you a tip. If you really want to be sly, like buy a couple things and have it like in a closet hiding somewhere on reserve. So that when you do something stupid and it got them all upset, <laughs> you're ready with it. All right. If you wanna become an effective gift giver, 
If you wanna become an effective gift giver, let me talk to you for a second, then you might have to change your view of money. So you married someone, you're in a relationship with someone whose love language is gifts, but you're stingy. But you're gonna call it, no, I'm a good steward of my finances. Well, you're about to lose them. Huh? You might have to change your attitude toward money. Each of us, now let me get into the psychology of finances, each of us has an individualized perception of the purpose of money. And we have various emotions tied to the association of spending it. Did I confuse you there? You following me, what I just said? Let me break it down. Some people are spenders. Some people are savers. Spenders and savers. The one who likes to go shopping and take that bank account right down to zero. Go get paid next week. We're all good. <laughs> got the other person who got the Excel spreadsheet. They break it all down. They call Dave Ramsey real quick. Am I allowed to buy a Snickers bar? <laughs> Spenders and savers, right? If you are a spender, you will have little difficulty purchasing gifts for your loved one. You love it, oh yeah, I don't care, let's go buy it. If you're a saver, you will experience emotional resistance to the idea of spending money on expressing love. I don't buy those things because I love you. <laughs> huh? I didn't buy you the Valentine's Day flowers because they were $35. I put that into our portfolio. Here's the bank statement, because I love you. I want you to see how much money we have in our savings account. I wanted flowers. I had Keith Sweat playing. You don't purchase things for yourself why would you purchase things for a loved one? Can I, can I mess with your head for a second, savers? By not purchasing something for yourself, you did purchase something for yourself. By not spending it and putting it in your savings account, you bought something. By saving, you purchased self-worth. I can look at my bank account and I can see how much money I have. I'm worth this many zeros. You also purchased emotional security. I know that if anything ever happens, I'm still good, I'm, I can be provided for, I'm good. So you, you bought emotional security. So then the question to the saver is, why wouldn't you do the same thing for your loved one? Because a person whose love language is gifts, when you give them the gift that they wanted, you purchase self-worth. You didn't just purchase flowers, you gave them self-worth. You are worth something to me and I'm expressing this to you through this gift of love. You're also purchasing emotional security for them. They can sit back and say, he loves me, she loves me. They bought me the gift they thought about me. It's deeper, than, it's deeper than just being a spender and a saver. There's a lot of emotion that's tied to this. First Peter 4, 7, and 10 is a transitional moment that ties gift giving and acts of service together. First Peter 4, 7 through 10 says this, the end of all things is near. Oh my gosh. If he was saying this back in 1 Peter, I wonder where we at now. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. He tells you, oh, we need to be praying more than ever. Amen. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Amen. If you're the person who loves being the head of the gossip and being the first one to post, you're not operating in love. You're not operating in love. Love doesn't cover up, love covers. 
Love covers a multitude of sin. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. I don't know why we got to host Thanksgiving again. Okay, just saying. (laughs) Now here it is. Transition. Each of us should use whatever gift you have received of the Lord to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Whoa, we got two love languages right here. Whatever gift you've received, serve others. Whatever gift you've received, use that gift to serve others. This perfectly ties these two love languages together. So let's go ahead and transition to acts of service. An act of service is doing something that you know someone else would like you to do. Some examples, cooking meals, setting the table, washing dishes, taking out the trash, fixing something in the house. Guys, completing fixing something in the house. Amen. (laughs) <laughs> washing the car the list goes on shoveling the sidewalk when it's snow whatever that is someone who creates a honeydew list for you here's the list of three things I'd like to, you to accomplish on the weekend while I'm away or here's what needs to get done this week I made a punch list if someone makes you a honeydew list Their love language just might be acts of service, okay? Acts of service. I'm about to step in a little bit icy water here, but as I step into this icy water and take the polar plunge, I believe I can help a few marriages today. Is it okay? And maybe you're not married now, maybe you're single, but I can help your future marriage. Is that all right? Okay. Acts of service is one of those love languages that you may have spoken while you were dating, but now that you got them, now that you're married, you speak it a lot less because you feel overwhelmed by all the tasks that you have to do around the house. So I'm gonna give you a little example. Uh, Met my wife. I was DJing a party. Her sister hired me to DJ a party. Uh, I saw her out on a dance floor. I was, she's fine. <laughs> Went up, started talking to her, invited her out to another party that I was DJing, started talking and all this. And she just, she asked me a question one time. She's like, what, what drew you to me? Like, what was the thing? And I was like, oh, I loved it when you had your hair hanging down. Like, you had this one strand of hair that was like hanging down. It was all curly in front of your face. And I was like, ooh. Keith Sweat in the background, you know, had a flower. I had it all figured out. And uh, every time I met her again, every time she knew I was going to be somewhere, guess how her hair was? A little curl hanging down in front of her face. I don't know the last time I saw the curl hanging down in front of her face. But she got me with it. She sold me on it. She sold me on it, right? It was every time. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. You're dating. Guys, you're trying to win this prize. So you're doing everything. You open the car door. And you stand there. She gets it. Are you okay? Oh, no. Put your legs. Move your legs. Okay. And you close the door. Now you're married. What? Is your handle broken? It's cold out. You can get in the side of the car. <laughs> yeah, I know who's right. I li- <laughs> oh, while dating, you did things together. You washed the car together. Hands through the soap on the car and squirt each other <laughs> with the hose. <laughs> now you squirt it with the hose? What's wrong with you? I want us cold. Come on, man. I ain't the only one trying to be cute, squirt with the hose. Next thing you know, you're about to get slapped with a frying pan. <laughs> Wash the car together. You went grocery shopping together. Maybe the first few months of marriage, 
you were cleaning the house together, you had your chore list, she had her chore list, but now some time has passed. Some time's passed, and you're the man of the house. She's the woman of the house. And now you got some expectations of your wife that she needs to assume the wife role, and you're gonna assume the husband role. Now, I am not speaking to you. This is directly at me. Thank you very much, okay? So you can just, you can, you can uh, benefit from my own delinquency, okay? If you want your wife to play the wife role, then you need to play the husband role. You want her to be the woman of the house, then you need to be the man of the house. If you had your man chores that you said you were gonna do, but you expected her, but you ain't doing them because you wanna watch your football, but you want her to do her woman chores, it ain't gonna work. There's gonna be a breakdown, okay? A breakdown begins when you want to impose maybe the storyline of your parents' marriage. You go into your marriage with these expectation. The woman cooks, she cleans, she takes care of the house, she raises the kids, and I'm gonna go to work, I'm gonna make the money, and I'm gonna come sit in my lazy boy at the end of the day. Dinner on the table. All right, first of all, can we just talk for that for a second? Dude, if you want that today, then you better be earning bank, especially in Orange County. You want your wife to be all that, stay home, cook for you, it's on the table, then you better make enough money for the whole family that she can do that. But if she's having to go out and work and hustle just as hard as you, then we need to work this out. We need to have some communication of our expectations. Maybe we take turns cooking dinner. I'm just throwing some stuff out, trying to help you, all right? A breakdown begins. One doesn't do their tasks, that the other one wants done, and then the other one doesn't do their tasks because your tasks aren't done. Does this hit home for anybody? Okay, Any, anybody in the room? Bed's not made, resentment. Dinner not ready when you get home from work, resentment. Car not washed, resentment. Lawn not mowed, so your lawn looks embarrassing to the neighbors, resentment. Your acts of service bucket is empty. And because your acts of service bucket is empty, you can in no way respond and fill their bucket with the love that they need. And the real tricky thing is when both husband and wife's love language is acts of service. You have to be very careful when your, both of your love languages are acts of service that you're speaking the same dialect. Because it's not just any act of service that fills their love tank. It's the act of service they deem the most important. It's not just any, but look, I did all these tasks, but I've been asking you to fix the dishwasher. See, that's the big one right there. If the dishwasher was fixed, Love tanks filled. It didn't matter that you mowed the lawn and, you, and, and that you washed the car and that you cleaned the garage. Those are all great for you. But this is the one that I wanted. This is the one I've been asking for. This is the one that fills the love tank. So let me give you a few tips and warnings today about acts of service. When we do for each other, I'm sorry, what we do for each other before marriage is no indication of what we're gonna do for each other after marriage. It should. That was the sales pitch. That's what you bought, but it's not reality. You wanna know why? Because before marriage, and don't take this the wrong way, you were in love. And in love, makes you in stupid. <laughs> it makes you fake. 
It makes you do things that you wouldn't do out of the love feeling, outside of the butterflies in my belly when she touched my hand while we're washing the car. I'll wash the car every day. Get that <laughs> feeling. Come on, you remember the movie Ghost? Making the pottery. Hands in the nasty clay all dirty. Stupid. I'll do anything for that feeling. Before marriage, we carried along by the force of what we call the in love obsession. After marriage, we revert to being the people we were before the in love emotions happened. Our actions are then influenced by the models of our parents. Well, this is how I saw my parents live. This is what I expect our life is gonna be. But then we don't talk about that. I'll tell you, one of our biggest fights early on in marriage, seriously, and it's stupid, I know. My wife, she would take the whole pot of rice off the stove and put the whole pot in the fridge. And I'm like, yo, did we not buy Tupperware on our registry? Do we not have Tupperware? You need to scoop the rice out of the pot, put it in Tupperware. She's like, you don't put rice in Tupperware because then it can't heat up the right way. Come on, somebody. Nobody had this conversation. I'm the only white boy that made a Boricua. You didn't know what was up? I didn't know. Didn't know we were gonna have Tupperware for years that never got used. That the pots just go in the fridge, I didn't know. Raised in my house, we had Tupperware parties. That people came over, we sold Tupperware. <laughs> fights, fights over pot. But that's how she was raised. That's how I was raised. We had to figure stuff out. We don't got Tupperware no more. <laughs> I lost. <laughs> if, if I take leftovers to work, she just pours it in a Ziploc bag. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lie. It's a lie. <laughs> I'm dead. You guys have no idea. Sorry. Love is a choice that cannot be coerced. Love is a choice that cannot be coerced. So this means, yes, in dating you were in love and you made the choice to love. You got married and all of a sudden you begin to get criticized and nagged and annoy each other and know how, doesn't matter how amazing the in love stage of your relationship is, now with the nagging and the fighting and the arguing and the complaining, you now choose to no longer be in love. Because love is a choice. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. I could choose to love and I can choose to be out of love. An act of service is one of those most volatile because there's really no room on that one. This is what I need you to do to fill my love tank. Philippians 2, 5, I'm out of time. I'm gonna close with this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. He wasn't humbled by someone else, he humbled himself. He says, I have a mission. I've made a commitment. I have tasks, I have chore lists. And if I wanna get Keith Sweat music playing in the background, I gotta do my honeydew list first. Submitting to one another, 
He said he submitted himself, humbled himself to death, even death of a cross. This is the greatest picture of an act of service. Laying down one's will, laying down one's desires, one's wants to fulfill the want and need of another. If you believe that you are in a relationship with someone whose love language is acts of service and you are not meeting those expectations, things have been volatile, then here's a tip. Go home today, identify someone's love language is acts of service and say, can you write down for me the top four things that you want me to do? The top four things you want me to do. The top four tasks that when I do them, you feel the most loved. Maybe it's, maybe you could take the night shift feeding the baby because I'm so overwhelmed. Maybe it's have the lawn mowed once a week. Wash my car and have it detailed. Whatever, whatever it is, what are the what, top four things that when you do them, I feel loved? If you're in here today and you've been here for some of these love languages already and you're saying, you know, Pastor Mike, I'm getting this on a humanistic level, but I don't feel loved by God. I don't think God could love me the way that I am, the things that I've done. I want, you to, I want you to know this, that every week I've shown you scriptures in the Bible where God himself or Jesus himself spoke your love language. John 3, 16 being the epitome of gifts and acts of service for God so loved the world he gave his only son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus says, I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but through Jesus we might be saved. He came to this earth to serve. He did not get down and make anybody wash his feet, but he got down in a posture to wash his disciples' feet. And I want to tell you today, he wants to wash your life today too. He wants to serve you today too. If you're here today or you're watching online, you never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, let's not go any further into 2021 distant from God. Let's draw close to him. Let's allow his love and his grace and his mercy to wash us today. If you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we wanna make it very simple for you today by praying this prayer with us out loud. The Bible says that with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. With the heart, we believe. So if you believe that Jesus Christ loves you, that he wants to be your Lord and Savior, then we need to confess that today and we do it with a prayer. And because we love you, we all say it out loud together to affirm you and make sure that you're not embarrassed. The prayer goes like this, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you just type amen in all capital letters? One of our online hosts would love to connect with you and get you signed up for our six day devotional called Starting Point. It's a devotional that will walk you through the first six days in your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're in the room today and you pray that for the very first time, would you give me the honor of taking two seconds and celebrating you? Would you just wave at me and say, hey, that was me today. I prayed for the very first time. Anybody at all real quick wave. Hey, I see you, all right. Anybody else real quick looking over here, here, here. Awesome, awesome. If you would like with your friends, stop at the Welcome Center on the way out. They'll give you that uh, six-day devotional called Starting Point. And if you're in here today and you know, maybe you're still on the fence, you're like, okay, that was great talking about relationships, but I'm not so sure about the God thing yet. Uh, we have a couple books available at the Welcome Center that talk about salvation. We have one called Welcome Home. It's something that we wrote in-house that talks about Christianity. Or maybe even grab that starting point devotional and see what it talks about, about getting your relationship with God kick-started on the right track. Father, we thank you today that your word will never return to you void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. We thank you, Lord, today that we can put these things into practice, into our relationships, that our relationships can be better, that they can flourish 
and that they can honor you. Lord, I pray that if we've misstepped in ways in our relationships that you would forgive us, you would cleanse us, you'd wash us, you'd give us the ability to forgive one another and grow in our God honoring relationships with your anointing and your power. We thank you as we leave here today, we're protected and safe. Everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name, amen. Offering baskets are at the door.